loneliness and gratitude. All right. Good morning. May I very quickly ask why you're asking that particular question? Yes. I find, I went to school in Wisconsin, old and dark and fucking I found myself very lonely, and it would help when I found gratitude daily. But it's a hard thing to find daily. I'm gearing up to go back to it. Okay. You know, loneliness is an interesting thing, and we'll talk about gratitude later on, but I think it's best to just approach each concept separately and then bring them together if they, in fact, can come to play together at some point. <clears throat> Your question is difficult because there are biological factors, there are sociological factors, political factors, psychological factors, and so somehow we have to kind of wrestle all those and then bring them together and see if there's a way out. And I don't really think there is, but that's besides the point. Let's, uh, You know, one of the best, I think, examples where loneliness comes forth is when you read the book of Job. If you happen not to be very religious and you don't care about sacred texts such as the book of Job in the Old Testament, the best book I think anyone in this class will ever be able to read is the book of their own life experiences. But like any book, first you have to be interested in the book, then you have to stretch out your arm and grab the book off the shelf, then you have to open and read the lines very, very carefully and closely. So if you're able to do that with your own life experiences, you will never ever find any book better than that. It's much better than the Bible, much better than the Quran, it's much better than going to any workshops given by any gurus or teachers out there. But the difficulty of reading your own book is that we are sort of creatures who enjoy self-deception very much. So reading the book of your own experience is going to be very painful because, especially when you're young, um, you, you suffer from two things, lack of experience, therefore knowledge and insight, and you also have a huge ego, and rightly so, because you assume that because you're young and healthy and you have all these dreams, you're able to kind of go about fulfilling them at any cost, and you think you can, and there are no negative consequences, which for the most part are untrue. <clears throat> the problem of loneliness arises only when there is an existing pain. And pain by itself does not cause loneliness. What pain does, it makes you more communal. If, for example, I am in pain because I haven't had food for a few days, what I will do, I will try to be as social, as nice in my greeting as possible. I'll come to you and I'll say, can you give me a buck? And maybe I'll add a smile. Or maybe I'll have my facial expression in a way where sadness and sorrow will overcome you and you will feel empathy for me. Feel sorry, sad for me, and you'll give me a buck. 
<clears throat> so initially when you have pain, it connects you to other people because you want help. There comes a point where maybe you've been betrayed by other people. Uh, maybe the pain is so intense where no one can really help you and you know that no one can really help you. And so you feel very, very alone. Now, the thing you need to understand about pain, and it's something that I think all of you guys should remember, you know, when this semester is over and beyond, just keep these, you know, this chart in your memory somewhere. Uh, it'll keep you honest. It'll keep you having the proper intentions when you want to do the same, some things. We have this saying in the Persian world, it comes from the Naqshbandi order. It's the mystical tradition of Islam, one of them at least. It's called Nazar bar Qadam. Nazar means to be watchful. Qadam means when you take a step. <clears throat> you know, sometimes you go out on a date, not because you want to bond with anyone, but you, know, you just kind of feel lonely and you want to lay next to someone. And so it's good for you to know before you go out on a date that this is what you want. You just want to have one night laying next to some person. You don't want to be with them for six months. So being aware of one's own intention, what one desires, the needs, very, very important because then it'll save you from future consequences that you may not enjoy. So if human beings have five different body parts, the first body that you and I occupy is our physical body, okay? The second body that you and I occupy are the emotional, well, the feelings and the emotions, okay? What the emotions want are very, very different than what the body wants. There may come a point where you say, I want to have a long life companion. Your body says, I just want to have a fling. So these two areas have very, very different intentions. This wants to go out with Jack or Janet only for a night. This wants to go with, out with Jack and John for 10 years. So you need to make sure which body you're occupying or it's occupying you. The next is <clears throat> psychological. Okay, now this can be negative, it could be positive as the rest of these can be. Psychological means something has happened to your physical body that it has been under attack. It can be negative or positive. You can either, let's say you're walking the lake and someone comes and just pushes you very, very hard to the ground and then starts punching you. And from that point on, you'll be very scared walking around the lake naked. That becomes part of your psychological world. In other words, this is a trauma that's going to be very, very difficult to overcome. Or you could be walking around the lake and you'll come upon someone like a Socrates who will inspire you. Both Socrates and being punched by the lake will create a lifelong psychological trauma. In other words, every time you find yourself alone walking anywhere, you're always going to look behind you to make sure no one's there. Okay. Now, <clears throat> then there is the intellectual body where you want to understand something, but you have certain habits feeling habits, you have certain feeling habits that even though you may want to understand and even though you may see certain insights about yourself, you will do whatever you can to destroy your intellectual body so you can go with what's more familiar and comfortable. Okay, let's say that for the past like five or six years you go from Oakland to San Francisco, from San Francisco to Sacramento, from San Sacramento to Kentucky and from Kentucky to Wisconsin. So what you've been doing is intellectually, once in a while you sit and you say, and Yama, why do you keep traveling around? Why can't you be grounded? Is it because something happened to your physical body where you just wanted to always be distracted? Something happened to your emotional body or something happened to your psychological body? Why is it that you can't simply stand still? Okay, and the intellectual insight, what you witness is so powerful that you crush this 
So it can go back to just traveling from point A to point B. The next is the spiritual body. Now, this is a very, very, for me at least, it's a very, very evolved place to occupy in life because most of us really are occupied with food, shelter, and clothing. We want security at any cost. You know, you want to make sure that emotionally you have a good amount of stability, that if there are chaos within, it happens once a week or once a month for maybe no more than five or ten minutes. Okay. And if there are psychological traumas inside you, you try to keep them low. You try to keep them down and invisible as much as possible. And intellectually, we just want to figure out who the hell we are. Because every single body has a certain history. Every history has a culture. Every culture has, lives in a certain society. Every society has a certain advertisement. And eventually, you're nothing but the product of your culture and society. Now, society can be big, society can be small. This can be an yame, okay, with a father, a mother, an aunt, and an uncle. And that particular community lives in Oakland. Oakland lives in California, which is much more diverse, much more open. California, under the heading of capitalism, individuality. So you have all these layers to go through. Now, <clears throat> the question of loneliness means the following. You can be lonely physically. You could be lonely emotionally. You could be lonely psychologically that there is this great pain inside you, but there is no one to share it with. You can be lonely intellectually that you see something. You know, let's say, I don't know, you see something about your parents or you have found out something about one of your parents and you want to share the news to the other parents, but you say, no, that's, I don't really know how that's going to unfold. And so you carry that cross. And you don't know with whom you can share. And that makes you profoundly lonely. Or you can be like Jesus, spiritually lonely. You just live in the desert. So when you talk about loneliness, the question is, where exactly are you lonely? I mean, if you're talking about your physical body being lonely, look, there are about 10 of us in this classroom, 15 of us in this classroom. There is no reason to be lonely. But your physical eyes, your physical body have five senses. You look to your left, you look to your right, you say, no, I don't feel comfortable with any of the faces that I see. So you keep remaining introverted. Okay. Now, the question is, why is it that you want to share something? And what is it you want to share? Now, <clears throat> you can share things that are positive. You can share things that are negative. When things are positive, you bring people together. When things are negative, you bring people together. The point ultimately is, after a while, to whomever you're sharing, they'll get exhausted of listening and being in your world, whether it's positive or negative. Okay. <clears throat> when things are positive, you want them to be repeated. When things are negative, you want to avoid them. And you will ask for help in both areas. If something gave you pleasure and you don't have the resources to create this on your own, you'll ask for help. If someone is, something is painful, but you can't figure it out on your own and you're kind of being under an avalanche of all this negative stuff, then you seek some help or some comfort from someone. Now, the question is, which area of your life do you feel lonely? And the, the reason I ask is following. If there are things that you have seen, okay, and they happen to have deep roots inside you. In other words, whenever you look yourself in the mirror, let's say once a day or twice a day, you feel this very, very isolating factor about yourself. You can go out, you can find someone, lay with them for an hour or two. But your loneliness is not going to disappear. This is surface contact. This has roots where the other person can't enter. Now, one of the things that you'll find in the book of Job, uh, since it's very difficult to read our own books, he thinks very highly of himself, very much like all of us in this classroom. You know, he goes to church, he pays his taxes, he's good to his boss, and... Uh, 
One morning he wakes up and his animals are butchered. The next morning he wakes up and his kids are butchered. He wants to understand, but he can't. But you know what he does? Gratitude. God gives and God taketh away. What can you do in the presence of such an awesome event in your life? You know, your mom just died, your dad just died, your kids just died, your animals just died, your trees all withered and decayed. What can you do? You have no power over, the, over life. You have no power over the events that just took place. What do you say? I don't know if there is a God, but one of the ways that we cope is by being thankful about things we don't really understand. God gives and God taketh away. And even when his wife comes to him and smacks him with a dose of reality, saying, how could you worship such a God? How could you be grateful for being in a world that gives and takes without any reason? But the truth is there is nothing else we can do. You know, it's, if you've read Aesop's fable, of um, sour grapes, for those of you who haven't. It's about this fox who has this great desire to have grapes. He loves grapes. And one day as he is walking, say, the streets of Oakland, he sees these um, grapevines. But there is a fence. So he puts his hand through the fence, you know, to get some grapes. And, and foxes are known to be clever and cunning. He applies all the wit that he has within him, but to no avail. He is not successful in getting any grapes. After like five or six or seven hours of trying, he says, ah, the grapes are sour anyways. Even if I had reached them, they would have tasted bad. Maybe there's a reason why God put this fence here. He didn't want me to have a stomachache. You know, it's like a man or a woman who goes out with 5 or 10 or 15, 20 people throughout, you know, 20 years or so, and not a single relationship works. And in the end, they say, as they have, for example, read the Bible or have gone to church, they say, maybe God just wants me to be single so I can learn a few things about my single life. The truth is no. God really, if there is a God, all of us are desired, wired to have a companion or to be social. The truth is you're far too incompetent, you're far too damaged to be able to be functional in any relationship. Even if Jesus Christ or some wonderful person was to walk into your life, you would probably just sabotage your relationship because you just don't know how to be functional in anything. So one of the ways that we are grateful or we express gratitude it's not because there is anything to be grateful about. What else can you do? Especially in a culture such as this, where you're encouraged to be positive, you know, that being negative is bad, being a cynic is bad, being a realist is bad, always see, you know, the greenery and the lush uh, just a few minutes away from the desert. Now, despite Job's wife trying to convince him that he needs to do something, examine his position in life, he says no. He wakes up the next morning and he comes to realize he has cancer. Now, there are two things you need to remember. There are pains that come to you from the outside. I am your boyfriend, I leave you, I am the cause of your pain. The other form of pain is you wake up and you're just sick. Your own body is beginning to betray you. It's not me, it's nobody. You could blame it on diet and genes and all that stuff, but ultimately it's from within. So there are two pains. One pain comes from the outside, the other pain from, comes from the inside. Right. Now, what happens is when the pain comes from the inside, there is no escape from that. See, if I'm your boyfriend and if I leave you, it'll take you about five, six months or five, six days or five, six minutes for you to recover. Then you'll go out, then you'll find yourself another boyfriend or girlfriend, or you buy a pet and your loneliness will disappear. If on the other hand, you are with me and you still feel profoundly lonely, 
It doesn't matter who walks in or out of your life. That loneliness, because it's from within, it's never going to disappear. It's never going to go away. So what happens is Job is now sick. <clears throat> now what happens when someone is sick? Well, you try to look for a cure. You go to the doctor. You tell your friends. We call it gossip. Okay? Why would you want anyone to understand your position? Because there is pain. You have no need for a companion if there is no pain, i.e. if there is no poverty within you. So remember that this particular poverty is not about you not having milk. It's not about you not having a diploma. It's about you not having a companion of sorts. If you're not being grounded in yourself, you feel empty, you feel incompetent, you feel as if something is missing. That particular poverty, it causes a great amount of loneliness. There is also biological, psychological loneliness and sociological loneliness. Mahatma Gandhi had once argued that capitalism will never allow anyone to have a meaningful life. Is it true? Capitalism will never allow anyone to be in a solid relationship for too long. Before we talk about the sociological aspect of perhaps what may cause loneliness, let me also approach it this way. You know when you're born and the moment you come out, you cry, you see your parents out there. They touch your skin, they hold you. You don't feel lonely, you're comforted. And let's say your temperament is not one of introvertedness. Introverts, for the most part, if you happen to be an introvert, Loneliness is who you are. You understand that? If you're an introvert, in other words, you like to spend a lot of time by yourself, or you have a lot of wonderful things around you, but you always feel incomplete. Or you don't think about things, you feel about things. You're not guided or governed by your thoughts or by your reflective abilities. You're guided by your emotions. If you're guided by your emotions, you're always going to be alone. And introverts have a tendency of always trying to be very creative. They're able to express or find companionship through reading, through writing, through poetry, through music. And they're usually the sun in any gathering. They make everyone laugh. They make everyone cry. Everybody revolves around them. If you happen to be an introvert, the truth is loneliness is going to be your lifelong companion. If you happen to be an extrovert, there are certain components in your physical life that will push you into feeling isolated. My sister had a gathering this past weekend on a Saturday. 50 people. They're all doctors, neurosurgeons, and heart surgeons, and this surgeon and that surgeon. There was nothing nourishing about any of the conversations. So I just went and sat by myself. In other words, sometimes when you don't find your own reflection in a community of people, they'll push you into feeling lonely. If that doesn't make any sense, let me try this other way. Let's say you came here with an agenda that you wanted to ask about loneliness. And you imagine that well, this is a philosophy class, and these are relatively interesting, intelligent people. Maybe you can just spit out the question on all of us, like dogs, 
in chase after this question and try to figure out what loneliness and gratitude are. And then you came very inspired, excited. You guys, none of us really care. You want to talk about something different. You feel disrespected. You feel even more alone. So sometimes it's the people you keep company that push you into feeling more isolated. <clears throat> when you're very young, you are in the cradle of your parents. When you're a teenager, you're in the cradle of your ambitions and your friends who think and feel like you. When you get to be an adult, you know, you have a job now and you're very, very ambitious. You want to buy a house, you want to do this, you want to do that. You want to get married, have children. When you get old, then you realize your body is slowly failing. Who can really understand that particular pain? No one. So you may have five or six kids, you may love them, but you walk into the kitchen alone. You walk out of the kitchen alone, you sit, because in the back of your head, what you're always thinking and feeling is my body is failing me, and no one in this room will ever understand. So being alone is something that human beings have no choice but to experience throughout their lives. But what you need to understand about just the anatomy of aloneness is that it is a feeling. That feeling is negative. Whenever you have a negative feeling, you want to share that negative feeling with someone. And there's a good chance you're going to be misunderstood. هر کسی از زن خود شد یار من و از درون من نجس اسرار من. It's the seventh or eighth line in the first book of the Masnavi by Rumi that let me just read you or give you the six or seven lines and then I'll tell you what sort of loneliness he's talking about and it could relate to all these different five parts. بشنو از نی چون حکایت می کند و از جدایی ها شکایت می کند که از نیستان تا مرا ببریده اند و از نفیرم مرد و زن نالیده اند سینه خواهم شرح شرح از فراخ تا بگویم شرح درد اشتیاق من به هر جمعیتی نالان شدم جفت خوشحالان و بدحالان شدم هر کسی از زن خود شد یار من و از درون من نجست اسرار من If I was to put you within the context of those five or six lines. Here it is. Enyame is like this reed flute. Reed flutes are this, this bamboo sticks that are hollow from within. Why do you become hollow? Why do you become empty? Because pain empties you. You know, you want to go to Wisconsin, you have a companion, you have a great house, you have this, you have that, but all of a sudden, there is this great amount of pain that just flowing through you. It hollows you. You look at your house or your home and you say, it's a house, but not a home. You look at your companion and you feel immensely alone. You look at your grades and you say, I don't really care. You want to go to Wisconsin and say, why? Because pain. It's like a vacuum cleaner. It empties everything out of you. And you feel completely vacant. What happens in pain? That when there is this pain, it's like something about you is broken into a thousand and one different pieces. What happens when you're broken? We are social animals. You want to go somewhere and you want to talk about your pain. I mean, in this culture, you drink it away, you smoke it away, you porn it away, you fight it away. In a much more traditional, evolved culture, you try to gossip it away. Some people go to a bar, you know, they drink a little bit and talk to the person next to them. You, you come to this class and you talk about your pain, or you call your mom, or you ask a friend. But the point that Rumi wants to make is this. When your heart or when your soul or when your mind or when your comfortabilities have been shattered into a thousand and one pieces and all that you have is pain, what do you want? You want to go somewhere and talk to someone, but you're very, very specific as to who you want to talk to. You want to talk to someone who's gone through the similar pain that you have gone through. 
if your parents have divorced, for example, I can abstractly understand what it means to have come from a broken home. I will intellectually understand, unless I'm very, very imaginative and creative in thinking, I'll be missing some very, very important components. And what you'll say is, Amir, listen, I want you to understand as well as feel what I'm saying to you. When you go to someone and talk to someone who has also come from a broken home, they will feel. But if they haven't been matured and a processed experience, all they'll give you is feeling, but no reflective abilities. I say, yeah, well, I, I, she feels exactly the way I feel. And there is no way out. And all of a sudden you realize your gossip makes you even more lonely. Har kasi azan khod shod yaraman. That when you speak about loneliness, I'm just going to assume that I understand your question. And then I'm going to give you my answer, as I have been rambling on for the past hour. And you're probably sitting back saying, you know, I asked Amir Sabzavari about loneliness and gratitude. He brings me the book of Job, and then he goes to the five bodies. What the hell is he talking about? Which means that as a human being, whenever you're in pain and you talk to anyone, they're going to assume that they understand you when in fact they don't. So everybody rambles on. So my question to you before going any further then is the following. Since I don't want to ramble on, since I have enough respect for myself and certainly respect for you, when you speak about loneliness, if you were to save me from rambling on uselessly, which kind of loneliness are we talking about? <clears throat> okay, when you talk about emotions, emotional loneliness, there is something you need to understand. Emotions don't just happen. It's not like you pour some water in a pot, you put it on the stove, and a second later, it's like bubbling. It doesn't work that way. What happens is sometimes moods happen. You just wake up and you just seem to be a little out of place. <clears throat> As you make an effort to put yourself in the right place, this mood becomes layered with feelings. It was just a tiny little seed. Now there is this feeling, and it can, it's very intense. I'm just not myself. And you keep trying to fix this. It won't work. And then you take this negative feeling or this feeling of loneliness to your work, Thinking that distraction will bring you out, it won't. You bring it to class, it won't work. You go to sleep, you wake up again, it won't work. You gossip with your friends, it won't work. And as you try to manage this feeling, it has now been like, I don't know, two weeks. Two weeks turns into a month, a month turns into a year, and all of a sudden you have an emotion. Emotions are always historical, always. If you came to this class and you're usually in a good mood and you came to this class today and you said, Amir, today I just don't feel well. It's just a feeling. If on the other hand, every time you come to class you say, Amir, I just don't feel well. And my feeling has to do with the fact that every single day I wake up, I have this negative feeling. I say, oh, this is no longer a feeling. Emotionally. You're just negative. And it's because there is a history behind that negativity. Now, sometimes, and because you have a body, and because our organism desires mostly positive, no negative, what happens when the negative is reinforced over and over and over and over again, the emotion of being sad always comes about. Now, the question is, where exactly did you place your body that was harmed, so much so that the mood of negative became the feeling of negative, morphed into the emotion of negative, and this emotion is not part of your psychology. You're just negative, period.
Do you know what you say when you say you may be spiritually lonely? You have really no need for your physical body. You have no need for the emotions, i.e. your history. There are no traumas inside you unless you have met Socrates and Socrates has planted inside you the seed of spirituality. And your intellect that tries to figure out what the hell your problem is after many, many years of trying comes to realize it has no access to fixing this world. So this, these parts of your life become irrelevant. All you're focused on is this. Now, if your problem is one of spirituality, you need to find someone who can give you that. Laying next to someone, they'll give you some, some comfort for a day or two or three or four. Eventually, you have to go back into the desert. You may read the book of John or the gospel of John or the gospel of Job or the gospel of Jack, and that may give you some release for a few days. But this, it means that whatever that takes place in your body, your emotions, your psychology, your intellect, it's not going to help you as much. Now, <clears throat> you may be very gifted in the sense that you're just born to be very spiritual. But since I'm a cynic, and I mean no offense, you can't be a very mature spiritual person at the age of 19 or 20 or 30 or 40, especially in America. It won't happen. So I'm just going to put this on pause for a moment. And I'm going to say the world of emotions for us Westerners, the world of emotions and the world of psychology are very, very closely tied together. That whatever it is that you're feeling is connected to your past. And since America is a traumatic culture that pushes everyone around at a very, very young age, it means that there are some issues in the world of psychology. Here's the other thing you need to understand. Your intellect acts like a messiah. Whenever there is pain, whenever there is a glitch in your software that keeps you from being healthy and normal, your messiah comes on and says, let me figure this out. But if your intellect does not come from a culture that is philosophical, reflective, religious, it lacks the right stories, what we call mythology, then eventually you realize you're also suffering from intellectual poverty. There isn't much you can do.